It's Thursday, and we have a shocker for you today. You know, I didn't know what this critical race theory was. I asked our producer, will you please tell me what this thing is? Well, critical race theory is now invading every corner of American society. So what is it exactly? And why have many states already banned it? And how is this weaponization of race becoming a dangerous threat to our freedom? Dale Hurd explains. Parents across the country are surprised and angry that critical race theory is being taught to their public school children, often without any discussion. And a growing number want it stopped. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Schools are trying to poison our children's minds, teaching them about things that they have no right to be taught in school. While some parents support the teaching of critical race theory. My name is Robin Scott. My pronouns are she, her. I'm here today as an LCPS parent and former student, not only in support of our school board's effort to improve equity, but to speak directly to our community, asking to stop turning equality into a weapon. But a new poll shows that most Americans oppose critical race theory, and at least 22 states have either introduced legislation to ban it or have already banned it altogether. It's offensive to the taxpayer that they would be asked to fund critical race theory, that they would be asked, asked to fund teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other. Critical race theory says racism exists everywhere and that whites will always be racist. So <laughs> I put this up because I really want any white person in the room to know up front that this is what we're dealing with. In his new book, Fault Lines, Pastor Vody Balcom calls critical race theory a cult. It has its own cosmology, it has its own saints, you know, it has its own law. Um, it has, what it doesn't have is a gospel because there is no grace in anti-racism. There is no forgiveness, there is no restoration. CRT is spread quickly from academia to corporate America, the military, and even churches. But opposition to it is growing. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, here's the story. Critical race theory is an analytical framework to analyze institutions and culture. Its purpose is to divide the world into white oppressors and non-white victims. Instead of traditional forms of knowledge, it holds up personal narratives of marginalized minority victim groups, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, as evidence considered irrefutably by the nature of the dishonesty of their mostly white heterosexual oppressors. The ultimate goal of this theory's proponents is to remake society so that the victim class eventually displaces the oppressors and becomes the new ruling class. Within this framework, white privilege and its unearned benefits become responsible for economic, health, and social disparities in minority communities. This system of thought advances a narrative of blame that blames white American guilty for the plight of blacks. And when it comes to education, members of the victim classes are to do all teaching. It is a worldview and narrative that commands white people to sit in obedience and listen quietly to arguments about their unjust gains, as well as their obligations to provide a remedy for them. In this case, to black Americans, whether they are descendant from slaves or not. There is no way out for whites when it comes to race critical theory, which assumes that racism is permanent and affects every aspect of society, including politically, economic, social, and religious institutions. The theory further advances the belief that being born with white skin itself confers unearned benefits. Therefore, any societal attainment of color blindness, which in race or ethnicity does not hinder opportunities, is impossible. Neutrality in law and decision making is a pipe dream that can never be attained. Therefore, this reasoning goes the oppressive system must be dismantled and destroyed. The flaw theory suggests that race and ethnicity will always taint and pollute every decision, and as a result, racial minorities will consistently lose out to whites because of structural racism. 
Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is what they believe. You say, I didn't believe it. It's horrible. That's being taught in the schools. It's being introduced into our military. It is pervasive in our society. It is absolute occult. It is absolute nonsense. Now with us now is Dr. Carol Swain. She wrote these words I just read. She's been a professor at Vanderbilt University and an associate professor at Princeton. She's an author, public speaker, and political commentator. She's written and spoken about critical race theory. And Dr. Swain, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 700 Club. Can I ask you Thank one you. question? Why, after the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War, the end of slavery, why is this critical race theory now coming to the fore? Well, I mean, there's a political advantage to keeping people divided by race. And I can tell you that I see it as the civil rights issue of our time. And it does involve uh, discrimination against whites, but it harms minorities as well. Because if you're told that you are a permanent victim and that no matter what you do, you're still going to be a victim because white people are privileged and that white people control your fate, I mean, that is not something that would inspire people to improve their lives. It's a very depressing, disheartening message, and it is setting us back, like in race relations. We were making progress. We are going backwards. And I know that, you know, America has been good to me. I love my country. I was able to thrive uh, through the equal opportunities that were, all, that were offered me after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Well, the message now is that it doesn't matter. Everything is about race. Doctor, is there any way out for white people under this critical race theory? Well, I think that, for one thing, critical race theory is white supremacy, but because it argues that white people have a property uh, 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 interest in their whiteness, that that is property, and it argues that only white people can rescue people of color. At the same time, it's saying that racism is permanent. I think that white people need to push back because it runs counter to our Constitution's Equal Protection Clause, all the civil rights laws. White people are protected by the 1964 Civil Rights Act and many state and local laws. And uh, it's not who we are as Americans in the sense that in America, we are a nation where the people know that it's not acceptable to shame or bully people because of the color of their skin. If it applies to racial and ethnic minorities, it also applies to white people, and it has no place in the church. And what I find is that a lot of pastors are being deceived and manipulated. They all are guilt-ridden if they're white, and they're going along with it, and they're giving deference to black pastors and black churches who are, for the most part, Democrats, pushing a democratic agenda because critical race theory has taken over the Democratic Party, and that's not good for our society. Uh, doctor, uh, how widespread now is this critical race theory? Is it really widespread? Well, uh, Sesame Street, uh, it, it, Sesame Street, Nickelodeon, they are indoctrinating kids, and you may have heard about the research now that they argue that babies are racist by six months. And so they want parents to intervene, to teach their children to be anti-racist. And they do this by making them conscious of race. And so the days, you know, when you grew up and you had a best friend and you loved your best friend and you didn't notice your best friend's race, I mean, that's how most of us grew up. Uh, now they want you to notice race first. And I think this can go horribly wrong because if you notice race first and you don't get to know individuals, if you have an unpleasant experience as a child with someone from a different race or ethnicity, you're more likely to, uh, to, to characterize that whole group based on your experience with one person. When we saw each other as individuals, that was less likely to happen. This is going to tear America apart, won't it? I mean, that's really, I guess, the game of the people putting it on. That's the intent, and it saddens me. I'm very disheartened by the fact that not enough people are standing up and pushing back. I also believe, Pat, that racial and ethnic minorities need to take a leadership role. 
uh, when we fought the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, that was a coalition of people from different races and ethnicities. And I find that many white people in America, they have been shamed to the point that they've lost their voices. They won't stand up for principles. And I think racial and ethnic minorities like me have to stand up and lead this civil rights movement, because this is a civil rights movement, and it will destroy our country. No good can come from critical race theory. And for those people that are foolish enough to argue that critical race theory will lead to racial reconciliation, they've lost their minds. Critical race theory cannot reconcile uh, anyone because it is based on division, and it has no place in the church. Well, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Dr. Carol Swain, a very distinguished academic and writer. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're like me, you really didn't know too much about it. Now you know. Now we've got to say something. We cannot allow this nonsense to be perpetrated in our schools and have little children at three years old or two years old, three months old, being taught that somehow they are either an oppressed minority or they are a racial oppressor. It is an outrageous thing, but it is being taught. Well, in other news, not much. That's what came out of President Biden's overly anticipated summit. Afterwards, Biden was asked whether their discussions on nuclear power and cybersecurity would pay off. So what was the president's default answer? Ephraim Grimm has that. Pat, the president and Vladimir Putin exchanged cordial words and planned some modest steps on diplomacy and arms control, but the summit didn't appear to really change anything. Both sides still have deep differences on key issues like human rights, election interference, and cyber attacks. The president gave Putin a list of 16 areas of infrastructure he said were off limits to cyber attacks and issued a warning the U.S. would strike back if attacked. And if in fact they violate these basic norms, we will respond. Critics question why the president only chose certain areas to be considered off limits to cyber attacks. Now people in both countries are waiting to see if anything actually comes out of the meeting. Back in Washington, a possible new compromise on the president's infrastructure bill. A group of 11 Republican and 10 Democrats are supporting a bipartisan bill that costs $1.2 trillion. At the same time, the White House is prepared to move forward without Republican support if necessary. And one of the major issues for Democrats on this bill, climate change. Abigail Robertson has the story. For years, both sides have expressed interest in working together on a comprehensive infrastructure plan. But like many issues, they can't agree on the details. While the bipartisan group is working on a solution, some of their colleagues are skeptical. This is as clear as day. No climate, no deal. Senator Ed Markey says it's time for Democrats to go their own way. We cannot let Republican calls for bipartisanship deny the American people the climate action that they have been demanding. Senator Susan Collins, one of the 10 senators negotiating the bipartisan plan, says their bill is focused on traditional infrastructure. Roads, bridges, airports, seaports, waterways, highways, Let me ask broadband, and I think that makes sense. The plan would cost $1.2 trillion over eight years partly funded by repurposing COVID-19 relief money. If you look at what has been spent, there literally is hundreds of billions of dollars in the pipeline going back to the initial CARES Act that was passed in March of last year. If it passes, Democrats will then try to accomplish the rest of their agenda through a separate reconciliation bill, which only needs 50 votes. A lot of my Democratic colleagues have made very clear to me, and I get it, uh, that you, know, you can't count on their vote for this more traditional infrastructure package if there's not a second effort, uh, which we call reconciliation. Senator Mark Warner, who's also working on the infrastructure plan, says the reconciliation bill wouldn't be as aggressive as what President Biden laid out, but could include tax reform. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to take on the challenge around climate change, and uh, we would be irresponsible if we didn't take those actions. Minority leader Mitch McConnell is hopeful they'll move forward on an infrastructure plan that does two things. Number one, does not revise the 2017 tax bill. 
figure a way to, to credibly pay for it. Those are the only two things I'd like to see. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced this week the Senate plans to take up both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the budget reconciliation plan in July. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. We'll watch to see what happens. Pat? You're wasting your money. Can you believe it? They're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars giving money to people who want to buy electric cars. I'm all for electric cars. I think they're terrific. But um, Volkswagen in, in Europe is doing the whole thing as a private company. But we're going to be spending our money on charging stations for electric cars, for batteries. And that's just the start of it. And it's going to be a giveaway of massive proportions. We absolutely can't do it. But it's just one more thing they want to jam through because here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. The Democrats are going to lose control of Congress after this coming election. They will lose. It's going to take five seats in the House of Representatives. And because of, of redistricting the other things, without question, that they're going to lose the House. That means Nancy Pelosi is no longer speaker. They, uh, the Republicans are aiming at several seats that they lost, like in Georgia, et cetera. They think they can win back. And so the chances are that the entire Congress is going to shift. And then coming up after that, uh, I don't know who the Democrats have to run for president, but as I can see now, there's no leader in the Democratic Party. So they know they've got to get everything they can get now. And there's a massive push to get as much money to enroll as many people to declare statehood for the District of Columbia, to make Puerto Rico a state and get more senators, to do all these things quickly. And that's what they're trying to do. And if you got any sense, you'll do everything you can, write your congressman call and get active in political life that you will say, no, 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 we're not gonna let it happen. Well, if you think gas prices are high now, better fasten your seat belt. President Biden's pricey energy policy is expected to drive the cost of gas and other energy bills sky high. And that's even worse. The president's plan could make the U.S. even more dependent on, you guessed it, none other than China. Jennifer Wishon has the details. You know, if there's one thing that makes Americans sit up and take notice, it's when gas prices and energy costs go up. Critics of President Biden's plan to remake America's energy portfolio say open your wallets and get ready to pay even more. This aggressive energy policy targets fossil fuels with the goal of making America 100 percent carbon pollution free over the next 15 years. It includes plans for more windmills, billions to build new energy efficient housing and a national network of charging stations to encourage more Americans to buy electric vehicles. We're going to reduce electric consumption and save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in energy costs in the process. But his critics don't buy it. What the Biden plan would do would actually remake the entire United States in the image of California or uh, Europe. And for those that don't live in those areas, well, here's what it looks like. In California, thanks to uh, the renewable energy mandates and other regulations that are in place. Californians often pay up to twice as much to heat their homes, to cool their homes, and to fill up their vehicles. And we see this playing out across Europe as well. Add to that cities like San Francisco, Denver, and New York proposing or passing measures banning the use of fossil fuel in new homes and buildings. In response, a number of states are outlawing bans over fear they would drive up energy bills require expensive appliance conversions, and leave Americans without any alternative during major outages, like we saw in Texas last winter. While seen as an energy savior, electric vehicles remain more expensive than their gas-drinking cousins and have been slow to take off in the U.S. The future of the auto industry is electric. There's no turning back. Along with more charging stations, Biden wants taxpayers to spend $174 billion on incentives for people to buy electric, like Ford's new F-150 Lightning. This sucker's quick. But these landmark proposals could make America even more dependent on China. In 2019, the communist regime provided the U.S. 
with 80% of its rare earth imports, elements needed to manufacture batteries, wind turbines, and solar panels. In fact, of the 35 minerals deemed critical by the Departments of Defense and Interior, China is the top global supplier for 23. Of course, we have a regulatory structure that makes it very difficult sometimes for companies to actually access those materials. That is a very real concern, and polit political leaders in both parties should be working to ensure that we can access those minerals that we have been blessed with. In testimony to Congress, Simon Moores with Benchmark Mineral Intelligence likened global battery supply to an arms race. What Western economies are only beginning to recognize, he tweets, is that in the electric vehicle and battery supply chain, they are the developing nation and China is the developed nation. Today, China boasts 107 battery factories with 53 actively producing. The U.S. has nine and just three are active. Biden has reversed many of President Trump's energy decisions, like canceling the Keystone Pipeline, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, and most recently tried suspending oil leases in Alaska's Arctic refuge, something Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan called a naked political move by the Biden administration to pay off its extreme environmental allies. Now Biden must follow Trump's lead in trying to strengthen energy supply chains here at home. we got to take over the world market. That's what this is about, being the best in the world and be exporting. He's directed the Energy Department to light a fire on battery research, manufacturing and processing. This is going to include new rules to ensure that companies that develop new products based on federal R&D funding manufacture those products in the U.S. So what is invented in America can be made in America by America's workers. But as the president works to boost new energy sources, many Americans are focused on sustaining what they use today, an issue amplified when the colonial pipeline hack left five southern states with empty gas stations and long lines. A poll by the Convention of States and Travolga Group finds 80 percent of Republicans, 45 percent of Democrats, and 57 percent of independent voters say pipelines are an important part of American infrastructure. And the Pew Research Center finds nearly two-thirds of adults prefer a mix of energy sources that includes oil, natural gas, and renewables. Transforming the way Americans think about, use, and interact with energy sources is one of the many heavy lifts Biden is attempting during his first year. This is a case where conscience and convenience cross paths, where dealing with this existential threat to the planet and increasing our economic growth and prosperity are one and the same. But he faces many hurdles, and critics who predict his plans will hit homeowners and businesses where it hurts in their pockets. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. What we've got to remember, folks, I've been to Beijing on a Sunday morning. I, I had a, a church service, and the air was so polluted coming back, I could hardly breathe. And that was on a Sunday in Beijing when factories supposedly were shut down. The, the air is so polluted over China, you can't believe it. Are they part of the Paris Accords? No way. So, I mean, we're going to cut down all of our energy in order to have a green uh, a, a planet, and the Chinese aren't a part of it, the Russians aren't part of it, and maybe there are many other countries like India that aren't part of it. So what are we doing? Well, we're crippling our economy in order to uh, do something for the planet which is going to be inconsequential. And we've got to remember, I mean, this, this is a fanaticism. Again, we talked earlier about a religion. This is a kind of a religion, this whole idea of climate, climate change. Sure, we've got climate problems, but we in America can't limit all of the resources we have and cut back on our uh, energy and cut back on our manufacturing capability and put a lot of people out of work and run up our costs of gasoline and in, in order to uh, help a climate that is going to be polluted by these other countries. And, you know, the big thing that if you want a nice, clean, burning energy is natural gas. And we ought to spend more time on that instead of trying to shut it all down. 
Terry? Like it was on fire. That's how Jamie Kane said her skin felt for two years. Jamie is married to a doctor, but he couldn't cure her. So Jamie's mom had an idea. What was it? And how did it lead to 100% healing for Jamie? You're about to find out. Jamie Kane and her husband Jim couldn't imagine anything spoiling their love for the outdoors. That is, until the summer of 2020, when Jamie developed painful cysts under her arms. Yeah, it was this intense itching. It was very, my skin was so inflamed and red, and then I had these cyst-like bumps under my arms, and it honestly felt like it was on fire. Jamie had been dealing with a rash under her arms for years, caused by the deodorants she was using. It go away and it'd come back and go away and come back and this has been something that's been ongoing. Her husband Jim, a family physician, diagnosed the rash as contact dermatitis. It's an allergic rash due to a sensitivity, usually something topical or like a soap or a detergent. Over the next several years, Jamie tried different deodorants, but they always caused a flare-up. In fact, the rash was getting worse. Then in 2020, after using a different, more natural new deodorant. I had developed these little cysts under my arms. They were very painful. Uh, they were spreading. They were just really embarrassing. Jamie stopped using the deodorant, but this time the rash and cysts didn't go away. So she tried several ways to treat the issue, or at least to make it more bearable. We tried steroid cream, steroid shots, prednisone, I tried all sorts of natural remedies as well, and nothing was helping it. Emotionally, I was very, very frustrated. Um, I was annoyed and um, a little bit depressed about this because I didn't know how long I would have this, if this would ever truly go away. You know, I was getting quite concerned. I have this beautiful wife that, you know, I don't want to see her suffer, obviously, and I can see she's very distraught. Jamie told her mother, a retired nurse, about her condition. She told her daughter to pray. She also shared the story of how she was healed one day while watching the 700 Club. My mom had said that she had gotten a word of knowledge on her right knee and she hadn't had any pain since then, so she encouraged me to also tune in to the 700 Club and, you know, perhaps I could get a word of knowledge, you know, as well. Taking her mom's advice, Jamie began to pray for healing. Father, I know this is not that big of a deal. I know it's not terminal, um, but would you please, you know, heal this? Every day she prayed and watched the 700 Club. Then in December of 2020, Terry Mewson and Gordon Robertson were praying for the needs of the audience. Someone else, you have a painful lump under your right arm, very concerned about it. I'm large enough for you to easily feel. God is healing that for you right now. It's just going to dissolve and be gone in Jesus' name. I was thinking, well, that's got to be for me. And, you know, I will definitely claim this because if this means that this is going to be resolved once and for all. Just a few days, it disappeared. Not one speck of anything left, not not anything. No redness, no nothing under my arms, all, all the cysts. We're gone completely, 100% gone. I told my husband, I was like, come look at this. These are completely gone. This is incredible. Praise God. You know, God's will be done. Jamie is happily living pain-free. She has even resumed hiking with her husband, Jim. God's sovereign. God's the healer. Every breath we take, that's not anything else but God. It had to be supernatural because the only thing that cured it and healed it completely was the touch of God. No, we're all always awed and inspired by what God does to people and their point of need and meeting their need. But what I loved about this was when Jamie said, you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. It's not terminal. You know what? God knows everything that's going on in your life and cares about it and knows you by name. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on your head. <laughs> he cares. So when you pray, it makes a difference. And we want to take some time to pray for you today oh, yeah. to further strengthen people's faith. This is Michael, who lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He arrived at the ER hyperventilating with his heart wildly beating. Tests revealed he had a massive blood clot in his heart. When Michael left the hospital a week 
later, he was told it would be months for him to return to normal activity. Then on April 24th, 21st, this year, Michael was watching this program, and as we started to pray, he put his hand on his heart and said, let them say my name. And Pat, you prayed. There's a hole in somebody's heart. The name is Michael. You're having trouble. You feel weak all the time. Right now, God's repairing your heart in the name of Jesus. Touch him. Weeks later, Michael was fully recovered and even back and to Morris, work. Will yes. you say my name? Uh, Betty, who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, suffered painful sores in her mouth. She was on May 20th of this year. She heard Terry say, somebody with ulcers in your mouth that never go away, God's healing you. Mm -hmm. Betty immediately felt a powerful sensation as it came out of the TV directly into her mouth. The strange feeling rested on both sides of her face. Betty said, God's presence came and I felt the ulcers dissolve. And guess what? She's completely healed and rejoicing. Now, folks, we want to believe God, and I know right now God is going to do some miraculous things in people's lives. So all I ask you to do is don't fight it. Don't say, well, it can't be me. Well, it can be because God is able. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands together, and we're going to pray for you, and we're going to believe God in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you and praise you. There's an angle on a hernia uh, in a, in a, somebody named Norman, and your inguinal hernia is being healed. That uh, thing is going back up into the uh, place it belongs, and there's going to be as if God is going to put a mesh in there to heal it. In Jesus' name, touch him. Terry? There's someone else. You have an issue with your lungs. It, it's not like you can't breathe, but it's... You can't take a deep breath. You never fully get oxygenated. God is healing that for you right now. You've had this for a while, but today you are set free in Thank Jesus' you, name. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's got bursitis. Uh, it's, I think it's in the elbow. Your bursas there are, just push your hand on the elbow. Mm -hmm. I believe it's Mary. Mary, in Jesus' name, God just healed you. Touch her. Someone else with a stomach mass. Um, boy, it's affected your life in many ways, and you're being treated for it, but not very successfully. God is healing that for you right now. Just feel that warmth Thank come you, over Jesus. your abdomen. Lift your hands and praise the praise Lord and receive God. it. You're healed. Lord, we thank you and bless you for the healing that you're going to do. We thank you for all across this audience. You're touching people. Uh, my goodness, I, I think there's a ruptured appendix. And, and you're really in the hospital, and you're suffering right now. Uh, I, I, the name of Mary, Mary Gold, comes to my mind. And th that rupture, it, it, all that poison is, is somehow going out of your system, and you're going to be healed in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, all across America, we pray for this nation. We are facing these critical problems that are coming upon us and a desire to destroy this great country. We pray for America, Lord. We pray for your people. Lord, we're not worthy of your love, but we ask, Lord, that you would make us worthy so that you may bless this nation in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Well, please call us, if you would, 1-800-700-7000, and uh, tell us what God has done. We love to hear the reports. But we'll also, people are on the phone to pray for you if you need help. So just go to the phone, call in. Somebody's there who cares about you. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Jack Phillips, the Colorado baker who won a partial victory at the Supreme Court in 2018 for refusing to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple, says he will appeal a new decision against him. A Denver district judge ruled Tuesday Phillips violated the state's anti-discrimination law by refusing to make a cake that celebrated a gender transition from someone who had went from male to female. Phillips is a Christian who doesn't believe people can simply change genders. With Dr. Gerson moreno Riano moving from Regent University to become the president of Cornerstone University, Regent has appointed a replacement. Dr. William Hathaway, who previously served as Dean of the School of Psychology and Counseling, will become the new Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs beginning July 1st. 
Hathaway joined Regents faculty in 1997. He's a well-respected scholar and distinguished leader in academia, clinical psychology, and behavioral science. And Dr. Anna Ord has been named the new dean of the School of Psychology and Counseling. She's a licensed clinical psychologist and considered a highly effective administrator and accomplished academic. Congratulations to both of them. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. The five love languages, they've taken Gary Chapman to the far corners of the earth. So did Gary set out to create a worldwide phenomenon? See for yourself. I could not have planned the life that I've lived. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, you know, I planned to finish high school and college, but then I planned to go to work. I would never have imagined that I would have the opportunity to speak at the Pentagon in Washington or to a gathering of ambassadors to the United States from 30 countries around the world. In my latest book, I share some of my journey, the failures and the successes and what I learned from each of them. My hope is as you read these stories and as you hear these lessons, you'll find hope and encouragement for your journey. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Gary Chapman. Gary, it's great to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Terry. It's always good to be back. You know, so many people's lives have been touched and improved by understanding the five love languages. People might be surprised to know that you and your wife, Karen, had a tough time starting out in marriage. Usually it's the little things that drive us crazy. What did she do that drove you crazy? Well, the reality is we had lots and lots of differences. She was very independent. She had been living her own life for a few years. And, uh, you know, I had ideas on what she should be doing, and she had ideas about what I should be doing, and they were conflicting. And, you know, when you're in love, you don't think you'll have any conflicts, and so you don't know how to solve them. So we ended up arguing, you know, and I would tell her how it ought to be. <laughs> she would tell me I was wrong. Uh, really looking back on it, pretty much the similar things that happened to many couples when they don't know how to respect each other and work through the conflicts rather than trying to win an argument. So what did you end up praying that you say was the greatest prayer I ever prayed regarding my marriage? Well, I was in seminary. Two weeks after we got married, I enrolled in seminary to study to be a pastor. And uh, I was miserable in my marriage uh, a few months later. And I said to God, I, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything I know to do, and it's not working. In fact, if anything, it's getting worse. And I don't know what to do. As soon as I said that, there came to my mind a visual image of Jesus on his knees washing the feet of his disciples. And I heard God say to me, that's the problem in your marriage. You do not have the attitude of Christ towards your wife. It hit me like a ton of bricks because I remembered what Jesus said. You know, when he got through washing their feet, he stood up and said, I am your leader, and in my kingdom, this is the way you lead. Wow. The leader serves. And I knew that was not my attitude. My attitude was something like, look, I know how <laughs> to have a good marriage. If you'll listen to me, we'll have one. <laughs> she wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> so I just said, God, forgive me. With all of my study, you know, of the scriptures, I've missed the whole point here. Please give me the attitude of Christ toward my wife. In retrospect, it is the greatest prayer I ever prayed about my marriage because mm -hmm. God changed my heart and gave me a desire to serve her. And you know, Terry, three questions made this practical. Simple questions. When I was willing to ask these, my marriage began to change. Question number one, honey, what can I do to help you? Number two, how can I make your life easier? Number three, how can I be a better husband? When I asked those questions, she was willing to give me answers. Mm -hmm, she told me. <laughs> and when I started responding, it didn't happen overnight. But within yeah. three months, she started asking me those three questions. Wow. When my heart got changed, then God touched her heart. Well, you and Karen were married 20 years before you discovered the five love languages. So how did you come up with them? They grew out of my counseling. Uh, they would sit in my office and one of them would say, I just feel like he doesn't love me or she doesn't love me. And the other would say, I don't understand that. I do this and this and this. Why would you not feel loved? And I knew the couples were missing each other. And they were sincere, but they were missing each other. So eventually I took time to sit down and read several years of notes that I made when I was counseling. 
and ask myself the question, when someone said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me, what did they want? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories. And I later called them the five love languages and started using it in my counseling. You know, if you want her to feel love, you got to speak her language. And she's going to learn to speak your language. And when couples would discover their language, try it. They would come back sometimes in three weeks and say, Gary, this is changing everything. Yeah. You know, so uh, that's where it all started. And uh, it's been amazing how God has used it all over the world now. Well, you've sold millions of books. You've traveled and spoken all over the world. And yet you always have remained an on-staff pastor. Why? You know, I've been at the same church now for 50 years on staff as a, as a pastor. And uh, I, I, it's because of two things. Number one, I believe the church is God's primary way of reaching the world. And secondly, I need a church family. I need to be a part of the church family. And so, you know, I've stayed in the local church because I believe in the local church. When you started out, did you ever dream your life would take the direction it's taken? Absolutely not. You know, uh, I just, I, I had no idea where, where it was going. I only knew there was two things you could do uh, in full-time ministry. One would be a missionary, one would be a pastor. And, and I, I saw missionaries as working in the jungle, and I didn't like snakes, so I thought, <laughs> God must want me to be a pastor. <laughs> but I never even dreamed of writing, you know, uh, and I didn't plan to be a counselor. It's when I got into the local church, I found out people were hurting in marriage and family. So I kind of got pushed into the counseling role, and it became a major part of my ministry. Well, it seems like it all started with that simple, obedient yes when God spoke to your heart about your own relationship and your family. You know, surrender is where it all begins with the Lord. I want to mention Gary Chapman's book is called The Lessons and Love Languages, and it's a life lessons and love languages, and it's available wherever books are sold. Gary, thanks so much. You always bring a great word of wisdom. Great to have you here. Well, thank you. I always enjoy being with you. Keep up the good work. And you. So much shame. That's what a single mom from Ukraine felt. Why was she shamed? Well, she lost her job due to COVID, and she couldn't feed her own children. And what's worse, she had recently emigrated or immigrated to Israel and had no family or friends to help her. Ludmilla is a single mom from Ukraine. She and her children moved to Israel to start their lives over. She got a job taking care of the elderly, but then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. People wanted to take care of their elderly parents themselves because they were scared of the virus. I didn't have many clients to begin with because I was new to the job, so the work just stopped. I was still struggling to learn Hebrew, and I didn't know where to go for help. For Ludmilla, the hardest part was seeing how it affected her children. It broke me trying to explain to them why we could only eat the cheapest, most basic food. I felt so much shame. Then another new immigrant told Ludmilla about CBN Israel. CBN Israel helps Holocaust survivors, new immigrants, and single mothers in need in the Holy Land. When we learned about Ludmilla, we started taking her groceries. There's so much variety. The food is very nutritious, and my kids really enjoy it. It was such a wonderful surprise for you to do this for us. It gave me hope. Ludmilla recently started a new job cleaning at her local courthouse. She says it provides more stability with flexible work hours. Thanks to CBN donors, Ludmilla's family got the food they needed to see them through this crisis. Now they can build the future they hoped for in Israel. I'm very grateful for what you've done for my family during this time. There have been many challenges and your support has meant everything. Thank you. Isn't it nice? All over the world, all over the world. And this is Israel. We have CBN Israel. We've got CBN China. We've got CBN Thailand. We've got CBN Russia. We've got CBN everywhere, all over the world. And Ludmila is just one of the many people who are being helped. Now, what can you do to make a difference? I'm asking for just 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And you become a 700 Club member, which to me is a very honored status. I mean, it's like a merit badge of accomplishment. 
you are a 700 Club member. You're part of the family of those who are helping people all over the world. And when you join, I want to send you something. God is for us. Verses of salvation, peace, and victory taken from the book of Romans. So I want you to call in right now, 1-800-700-7000, and we want to count you as an honored member of the 700 Club. Terry? Well, I want people to know what others are saying about God is for us. This is Sheila. She lives in West Covina, California, and she says, I found God is for us relaxing, calming, helpful, and peaceful. I would like more of this from Pat. It's good for the soul. <laughs> she thanks us, yes. <laughs> well, Sheila, we'll do what we can. Yes. So I'm, I'm glad to <laughs> get them out. sound booth with All right, we've got some questions. I don't know if we this do. is good for the soul or not, but go ahead. <laughs> Remains to be seen. All right. Okay. This is is Rochelle Pat who says, what is a cult? Well, a cult really is a, a group that is under the control of a particular leader who adheres to a, a rather off-brand type of, of doctrine. It can, be, uh, it can be religious, it can be some other kind of a cult, but I think that's what it amounts to. It's, it's, it's an aberrant group of people who are under the leadership of some person who himself or herself uh, is not in accordance with the mainstream of, 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 of law of thought, all right? This is David who says, I have read how in the Old Testament that angels looked upon human women and found them beautiful and laid with them, producing children called Nephilim. This indicates that the angels are capable of procreation and sexual activity in general. <laughs> when we enter, here it comes, when we enter into the kingdom of heaven with our transformed bodies, will we still be able to have physical relations? And if the marriage covenant is until death, would we still be bound by it in heaven? Uh, I, I hate to take away your sex in, in, in the afterlife. Uh, it doesn't say angels. It says sons of God. If you read it right, it doesn't say the angels. I don't know who translated it, but it says sons of God looked upon. And who are the sons of God? We're not sure. And who are the Nephilim? We're not sure. We, all those things, there's all kinds of teaching about it. But it doesn't say angels. When you get to be in heaven, Jesus said they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like the angels. Angels do not procreate. They, they are uh, spiritual beings, period. So if I, if I took away your sex when you go to heaven, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> Try to get in. Being in heaven is a whole lot better than having sex. Right? There will be other activities. <laughs> Being in the presence of God is far, far, far more satisfying. All right. This is Dorothy who says, Pat, I heard you referring to the elect. Who and what are they? Well, the elect, in a sense, are, are ch chosen, those who are chosen to be with God. They're used to, in the Bible, it talks about the elect lady. The, it means those who are part of the family of God. And uh, I, I think that's what it amounts to. It, 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 they're picked up. I think elect doesn't have to do with an election. They aren't voted in anywhere. This we is, leave you with yes, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's that's time. all the time we've got. We okay, leave you go. with today's power minute from First Peter. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. And tomorrow we've got music icon Michael W. Smith. He's paying tribute to his biggest fan, his father. We'll see you then for Terry and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And may God bless you richly. Bye-bye.